I don't think we've been told the truth. And, you know, I've learned some things that I got questions about. When you ask the questions, you don't get no answers. You get a gun pointed at you. And that's basically what, I mean, that's the situation we got. So, anyway, that, outside of that little die truck. All right, in the Bruce Shaver versus Union Pacific. Okay, in this case, it says income has been taken to mean the same thing as used in the Corporation Excise Tax, um, Excise Tax Act of 1909, in the 16th Amendment, and the various revenue acts subsequently passed. So Bruce Shaver said this is the same as what was going on in 1909 under the Excise Tax. tax. So the Pacific Company, we must reject in this case, as we are rejecting the cases arising under the Corporation Excise Tax Act of 1909. Uh, Doyle versus Mitchell Brothers, the broad contention submitted in behalf of the government. So the government's making these arguments. The court said, you can't make that argument. That's exactly what they're telling them. That all receipts, all receipts, everything that comes in are income within the pro proper, term, proper definition of the term gross income. And that the entire proceeds of a conversion of capital assets in whatever form and under whatever circumstances accomplished should be treated as gross income. Certainly, the term, in, term income has no broader meaning in the 1913 Act than that of 1909. So what they're saying, if you're Walmart, you sell billions of dollars a year. Do you pay tax on all the billions? Or just your profit. Pays on a profit, right? Not everything that comes in. If I'm a plumbing contractor, I pay a man twenty dollars an hour, put pipe in a ditch, charge thirty dollars. What's my profit? No. Ten bucks. I have a twenty dollar basis. Pay him, and I make ten dollars. Get rid of overhead and all the other, you know, all the other factors. But that ten dollars is my profit. What's his basis? What does he pay his tax? The whole 20. His basis is zero. Uncle Sam, under the, under the formulation of our laws, is saying his labor is worth nothing in our eyes. Was that the intent? I don't think it was. And I don't think it is today. But we uh, won't go there. Uh, okay, the 16th Amendment. 16th Amendment was 1913. It reads, if you go on the next page here, Congress had the power to lay and collect taxes on incomes from whatever source derived without apportionment among the several states and without regard to any census or enumeration. So, I'm going to pass this right here. I so just to speed this up. So, in 1916, we get the Bruce Shaver case. The Blue Shaper uh, challenged the constitutionality of Union Pacific, again, an individual who's going to have withholdings of his dividends and gains uh, by Union Pacific, withholding and payment income tax on his withholdings, and he said it was republic to the Constitution. This is a very long, detailed writing, but it's, it, and it's somewhat difficult, but I'm going to make sure that I hit this. All right, in this case, the government was not a party to it, but because of the Union Pacific, let the government know that they were bringing this case, that Bruce Shaver was bringing this case against Union Pacific, and of course the uh, government had an interest in getting this tax money, so they filed an amicus uh, curiae, I think this is a correct pronunciation, a friend of the court brief in support. And that support, basically the government said that we can tax anything. That was their position, and that was their argument in Bruce Um And then they, the response of the court, uh, the various propositions are so intermingled as to cause it to be difficult to classify. We are of the opinion, however, that the confusion is not inherent, but arises from the conclusion that the 16th Amendment provides for a hitherto unknown power of taxation. That is, a power to levy an income tax which, although direct, should not be subject to the regulation of apportionment, 
applicable to other direct ta taxes. And the far-reaching effect of this erroneous assumption, like the court's telling them, this is an erroneous assumption, uh, will be made clear by generalizing the many contentions advanced in the argument to support as follows. Then it goes on. Well, basically, the government said we can tax everything. Now then, we have a third power of taxation. Indirect, uniform, direct, apportionment. Now then, the government said we got this third, third issue over here, direct, unapportioned. In the Bruce Arbor case, the Supreme Court says there was no additional power of taxation. What you're saying, Mr. Government Man, is that this new law totally overrides this law here. It makes one portion of the Constitution, completely overrides one portion of the Constitution in confusion. All they're saying is what the Bruce Shaver case did was it said that don't consider an income tax a direct tax. It puts it in the class of excise which has to be uniform throughout the United States. It cannot be classified as a direct tax. So if it's classified as an excise tax, indirect tax, what do you have to pay? You have the choice. If I want to participate in that activity, then I'm responsible for the tax. If I don't participate in that activity, then I'm not responsible for the tax. So that's what that says. And again, still down in 1916, this area right here, we hadn't taken this jump. Right? If you look at the time frame of all this stuff, it starts to make sense. That's all. That, that's my position. So the Bruce Shaver case was critical in that <clears throat> um, in understanding where we were, why that graph looks like it does, and what happened. So the Bruce Shaver case condensed. This is just, yeah, this is just my position on that. Uh, states the federal government can tax income derived from property regardless of source. The gain does not diminish the source. A $100 bond yielding 5% issued to a corporation incorporated under the laws and the authority of the federal government owes a tax on the gain derived, a tax on the $5. The $100 basis, which is the source, is not subject to a tax. The tax is an excise which can be avoided. Don't buy the bond. It is not a direct tax on the property, the $100. So that, in a nutshell, is where we started all the way back. Uh, there's a clear distinction between profit and, uh, profit and wages. I want to hit a couple of um, court decisions that give, uh, that basically support this. In Connor v. U, um, U.S., now I'll go back up. It was next one there. Back up. Okay, right there. Uh, Congress has taxed income, not compensation. Ask the IRS. They say, did you have any income? I had compensation. Click. They don't want to talk about it. Because compensation is direct trade. I'll help you pay that parking lot if you'll help me shingle my roof. My roof. When you get the work done, it's a direct trade. There's no profit. No profit and gain. Right? But as soon as I go out there and help you with that and you give me 100 bucks, was it, it was an even trade. I gave you my labor to help you do that parking lot. But they won't access to the whole hundred dollars. <laughs> so any game. Uh, and I'll reverse the V. Halstead. There is a clear distinction between profit and wages or a compensation for labor. Compensation for labor wages cannot be regarded as profit within the meaning of the law. The word profit, as ordinarily used, means the gain made upon any business or investment. A different thing altogether from mere compensation of labor. Well, there's there's, that. there's other other additionals in here. I won't read them. Um, on in the New York Times, at the conclusion of Bruce Shaker, 1916, um, basically it said that the basically 
We are of the opinion, however, that the confusion is not inherent, but rather arises from the conclusion that the 16th Amendment provides for a hitherto unknown power of taxation, that is, the power to levy an income tax which, although direct, should not be subject to the regula regulation of apportionment applicable by the direct, uh, by the direct taxes. Again, New York Times say it, it gave no new, granted no new authority of taxation. Uh, we can get into Stand in Baltic. I mean, there's a lot of court cases. They're all listed. I'll, uh, we're going to be running out of time and shortly, so I'm going to kind of get them through this. You can have the files. I highly recommend that um, if you have an interest in this, I mean, I, I look at what's going on out there and I keep saying it. How it, if, if, the gut, if, my, if my labor and my property is completely subject to the whims, yeah, to the whims of these boys in Washington D.C. Where's it going to end? And we, I mean, we've got some very, very serious issues that are going on in this nation. These youngsters are hosed. I brought three of them into this world. I've learned a whole lot in the last five years. I'm not just going to turn it over to them and say good luck because it's just not right. You look. You know, we talk Social Security, Medicare, and, I, and I'm not looking for individual deals with this. These debts are never going to be paid. They always talk about the 14.3 trillion, folks. There's another 150 of unfunded, off the book stuff that's going on out there. These kids cannot pay it. 1950, it was 16 to one on Social Security. 1960 to 70, 80, it was eight, eight of me paying for one individual, paying for grant. And we were told, hey, we can keep this thing going. I mean, we were lied to. Bottom line is, my gut is, we, we, I've been lied to a large majority of my life. These youngins, it's going to be two to one. They can't do it. They cannot be that much more productive than I've been. And I've worked more than my share of 70 and 80 other weeks. They cannot be that productive. It ain't going to work. And they refuse to get honest. Patriot Act, I mean, we go through a lot of the different things, but bottom line is, people are going to have to make a decision where they're going to go. <coughs> we need to have some honest discussions, but we need to have some honest facts in front of us. You know, when, you talk to, uh, when you're talking to candidates, define income. So hear what he has to say. Income's profit and gain. It tells us right here, profit and gain. There's my labor, my property. Hear what he has to say. My mind, my labor is my property. He doesn't have any rights. I, I, I'm not asking you if I go to work to feed my kids. I, you know, sorry, buddy, but, you know. <laughs> you know. But anyway, so that's my position on this. There's a lot of information. Uh, I've also included some links down at the bottom. If you're going down, sources of information. Truth Attack, Tommy Pryor. 40-page memorandum, lawyer, brilliant man. He had a buddy that told him, you don't have to pay the income tax. There's no law that says you do. Tommy said, you're going to go to jail. I'm going to prove you got to pay it. Tommy spent four years. Here is a, a, a lawyer that went through the process, received awards, was the head of the GOP in the state of Louisiana. Smart dude. He spent four years. He couldn't find it. And he is mad. He's, because it was the same thing. He went through the program. He went through the school to learn the law. And he just assumed like I was. He said, this is what mom and dad told me to do. This is what I've been doing. And, you know, how much more they going to take? Um, we the people, I know everybody's familiar with CC 2009, <clears throat> what Bob Schultz has done, the history that he's built up, a lot of information. Uh, there's a book, Constitutional Income, Phil Hart. Do you, uh, do you have any? Phil Hart's a legislature. Now, now, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know, right? There, you know, it's just this information. There's information that will make you think. I recommend you study it. And if you're armed with information and we ask the right questions, we're going to embarrass a lot of people who don't want to be, that don't want to be embarrassed. And I said we have that. Yes, sir. Quick question, Mike. You mentioned that. 1862 Civil War, that's right. the first income tax. 
did the Congress just throw that out after the war? Yeah, the, most of the most of the wars or most of the laws from 1862 that time frame. Because you got to remember, there was uh, and, uh, what's the word? Well, habeas corpus was suspended. Martial law was implemented. If you go back and you study it, the only one that wasn't thrown out through an act, act, an act, a legislative act of Congress that said all these old ones are in this time period are null and void was martial law. And there's a lot of conspiracy issues going on with that aspect because if that law wasn't overwritten in 1864, 65, when the other ones were, was martial law still in place here in the United States? That's a different conspiracy issue that I, I, I haven't spent nearly as time on that I have with this one, but those laws were. Uh, those were overtime.